Morning, Jerry. Hello, <laughs> hello, Emmy. Hello. I am What's full happening? of mischief today, oh, and yes, I have a serious side. Okay. Would you like to hear my yes. latest obsession <laughs> and what happened to me? I certainly would. That's why I got up this morning. I was thinking I've got to touch base with the big G. All right, what's going on? Tell me what's happening. Well, yesterday morning I was minding my own business watching (laughs) House Hunters International. Awesome. It, It gives me hope. It gives me hope to know that somewhere, some at some point in time in history. Lockdown will end. Yes, people. And and I was sort of um I, I was enjoying the show. It was a nice oh, young yes. couple in Geneva. Oh, um, you Love. Know. oh Geneva. Lovely. Yeah, I've watched these episodes before. So oh, this was oh, a it was a, re- it was a review. <laughs> yes, no, no one, <laughs> no one apartment can meet all of their needs. And of course, the budget considerations <laughs> are very pressing. Oh, God. Um, so uh, in Geneva, uh, <laughs> Switzerland in general, the Zurich es- the Zurich episodes are also a dead teeny bit stressful. Uh, oh, yes. But anyway, yes. so I was feeling quite pleased with myself. <laughs> oh, I, get, oh, uh, oh. I was thinking to myself, extended lockdown, 300 oh, recorded yes. episodes of House Hunters International. Oh. Magic. Magic. <laughs> Paradise. Paradise. <laughs> so, Okay. So, as I said, I was minding my own business and my yes. daughter comes in and says, yes. why are you watching House oh. Hunters International at 7 o'clock in the morning? And I Impressive. said, because I can. However. Sorry. Sorry, yep, yep. However, mm, there, there's, yeah. there's doubt coming in. There's a little oh. bit yes, of a so. niggling doubt because, it's become obvious to me when I think about House Hunters International and how I'm strangely invested in newlyweds in Amsterdam, families in Costa Rica. Uh, somewhere and, else. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Americans, you know, always wanting another bathroom. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought to myself, yeah. Okay, uh, yes. Have I crossed a line? Uh, do uh, I fantasize too much? Is the escapism well, oh, yes. pathological? Now Okay, so yes, we're becoming a bit more serious now. Okay, I'm with you. Is it becoming mm, mm. Mm. now part of this is I think the psychology thing and the clinical psychology thing. Maybe it's yeah. just a human thing. Maybe where you always think you've got the disease you're talking about. <laughs> Uh, so sure. it tends to be mental health and clinical psychology because we read yeah. a lot about mental health. We, you know, see a lot of different diagnoses. Um, so not this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but I've no. also become obsessed with if I'm avoidantly attached and if I have a personality <laughs> disorder. Oh, bless you, um, Carrie. Of course, I dismiss the last one because oh. I don't think my characterological problems with impulse control or interpersonal <laughs> relationships have anything to do with such a stigmatizing diagnosis. Uh, so, okay. So okay, we will so, completely dismiss that straight away. Right. So it's sort of an elaborate form of rumination to deal with an emotional state, I'm guessing. But what is the emotional state? Wow. Like stress, stress levels, anxiety, like what do we think it might I, be? I think uh, I did some research because oh, I good. thought research G- Google? is the go did here. You went to Dr. Google? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, 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 oh legit, legit research. Le- legit, <laughs> the psych info, I don't know what it's oh, called, search okay. engine. So, search engine, okay, right. So good. a literature uh, search. Oh, you did a lit search. Okay, good. Did, oh, did a lit right. search, not a very big one. Oh, okay. uh, because it's a very new construct well, to me. I well, you, you, you knew where to There's not much out there, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, new new phenomenon, new clinical phenomenon, right? Uh, so I think that's what academic psychology uh, yeah, does maybe. really well, which is defining a construct and yeah. working out how the hell to measure it and sure. then clinical psychology comes in with is this associated with various diagnoses is it pathological 
Uh, is it um, a trans diagnostic process? And I wow. love that kind mm. of research as well. Like, is this something that applies to numerous human problems? I guess put in English. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah and yeah. then done really good work on rumination which does appear to be a trans diagnostic process as well yeah. as i guess even more relevant loneliness oh uh, wow okay so, so it's sort of a form of elaborate academic common sense no i i i think i think so and okay. then we have the most useful the most useful component of all of that is probably yeah. the end component of all of that, yeah. which is how it fits into treatment. And yeah. okay, yeah, good they're call. getting they're getting there on things like memory, attention, yeah. avoidance. Yeah. yeah, they're the only um, trans diagnostic processes I can remember. So <laughs> moving <Wow>. on. <laughs> no, that's pretty good. That's pretty. It's actually quite um, timely. In yeah, just, yeah. Just, yes. just thinking about a couple of cases I've got at the moment where there's like lots of distress appears to be related to early childhood trauma, possibly uh, damage, maybe even brain damage and mm-hmm. mild, but just can't put our finger on exactly what's wrong, you know, mm. can't, can't get to a place of going, right, what is it? Why am I like this? Why am I not getting better? Why am I different to others? Mm. You know, it's mm. the meaning meaning making of the experience that's part of the distress, you know. Mm. And that's mm. a, I mean, I think that that's when gr- grief, grief, grieving processes take take over, and you know that you know potentially people can stay stuck in a, in the first stage of grief for a very long time. That, that shock, you know, this didn't happen. It's not real. Mm. And, and then we can tip into anger. You know, mm. rage, rage that it happened, somebody's fault, not, you know, mm. it's wrong. And if we don't receive support in that phase, it's hard to move to the next phase, which is to feel the sadness, which is where we're starting to process the loss, we're starting to heal mm. because it's also bloody uncomfortable, you know, and you have to feel really, really vulnerable. Nobody wants to go into that. No one likes that. There's humiliation, shame there potentially. Mm. Sometimes terror, there might be a memory of terror that we're just trying not to go into. Anyway, it's just rough terrain, Jerry. you know. Mm, mm. Because there's always going to be emotional and behavioural components. Yeah. Like there's always yeah. the surface stuff and then there's always the underlying processes, whatever they may be or however, yeah. however we choose to describe them. Um, yeah. But... Do you want to hear but more about fantasy prunes? I, I do. Yep. Yeah, yes. Okay. Let's you don't right. need it, though, no. as much as no. I do because I, you don't maybe, sort of okay. pretend you're a tradie called Aiden. I uh, just, we haven't had Aiden out for a couple of episodes, so he's come back, has he? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he seems to come well, like a fairy, he's like a fairy godmother. He just rocks in when, when the need arises, I feel. Well, <laughs> Given what I've recently found okay, out, right, which right, is that on. fantasy proneness may actually uh, be a pathological just, process, and I have oh, a journal you. article oh, by gosh, one wow. Stephen J. Lynn. Never I've heard of some... Stephen J. Lynn before. No, but, well, he's got published though, um, so he must be. Yes, you know, no, yeah. I don't know. I think he's a big um, wig. Yeah, um, but he he's he's written an article that yeah. implicates me as not as functional as I think. Oh, dear. Uh, empirical okay. research on fantasy proneness and its correlates, oh, 2000 yes. to 2018, uh-huh. a meta-analysis. And he says... 2018, okay. Right. Uh, meta-analysis, effect, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Right sizes on. Let's were go. large How big? For, uh, the correlation between fantasy proneness and... Hallucinatory uh-huh. experiences, magical wow. ideation, perceptual okay. aberration, dissociation, and excessive daydreaming. I was going to say it sounds Stephen like a trauma, Lee. trauma thing. Yeah, <laughs> we but, do. okay. Uh, yes, yes. This this is actually all all jokes aside. Yeah. Uh, the trauma researchers posit that fantasy proneness is due to trauma, yeah. but 
now they're thinking that the effect sizes for self-reported trauma were small. So it Yeah, interesting. May, That's very yeah, it might be yeah. not a specific, it's hard to identify a specific incident, perhaps. It's more Yeah. I mean, look, it, I don't it's not a formal diagnosis at this time, but it might I think it might be in the future. The concept of complex PTSD is something mm, that rocks mm. in all the time so it's not just one incident it's like a whole raft of experiences that get clumped together probably form a big trauma schema jerry i know yes. you love a schema yes or or the other idea that's been put mm. forward okay so what's our yeah. question one of our questions okay right is, yeah. is fantasy proneness adaptive or maladaptive Okay, good uh, question. And, can, and can the research help us in All right, yeah, let's go with that. that. Rationalism. I mean, that's, let's see if we that's kind can... of, and the answer may be no, right? The answer well, may we, be... we, we don't know yet. We've got to have it rounded up the flagpole, <laughs> to mm. quote Dilbert. <laughs> mm. quote... So is fantasy mm. proneness a form of dissociation connected to trauma? Mm. Um, or Might is be. it, and of course I'm in favour, or, or you know, it could be, or you know the hypothesis I'm in favour of, which is it is a special form of adult play. Uh, I, I think I think both could be true. You know, like like I think there's a certain amount of healthiness to using your imagination, and you know, if mm, you want to cha- mm, change mm. something, you first have to conceive of what it should look like, where you want to go. And I think sometimes fantasies serve the function of, well, there's an obstacle in my life. I can't get to, we're, we're just, can't get to Bali myself. So I'll send Aiden in my imagination there because it's sort of, it's not quite the same, but it's a bit like, it. it's like, it's like imagining eating chocolate rather than really going for it. <laughs> so it's meeting, it's a partial need. You're imagining meeting a need, you know? And I yes. Think that, so that process could be um, up the, say coping skills end of the continuum and then up the other end you can get I suppose at the extreme level you get delusions and hallucinations yeah yeah so you think it's a continuum well, uh, and might be yeah and, and this is I guess what they're kind of getting at although this point yeah. is super interesting which is that with fantasy proneness um it may be healthy if there's sufficient executive control. So oh, whether yeah, it's adaptive or maladaptive yeah. is if you're stuck in it, if it's a problem in your life, which I guess yeah. is pretty basic, but yeah, the, exec- common but sense. the yeah. executive control may be the moderator that is then affected by trauma. I think well, it, it doesn't get to be classified as clinical unless it's severely impacting on your life in terms of your ability mm. to cope. So mm. otherwise it's just idiosyncratic character traits. <laughs> <laughs> Thank like, you. That, that makes me sound a lot better. Do you hear well, that, Stephen J. Lynn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it has, to, it has to be really compromising your ability to cope with the basic demands of independence, like looking up, working, feeding yourself, mm. you know, mm. not, not destroying your relationships beyond it, which is absolutely new, you know. <laughs> Yes. You know, not isolating yourself, you know, homelessness. I mean, if, if your fantasy world is contributing to that, and, and I suppose drug use factors into this a bit as well. So, you know, drug use itself is not, it's not a fantasy exactly, but it facilitates. Mm, um, escapism. A, yeah, or a coping mm-hmm. with some experience that you don't know what to do with so you know you're leaning on and i think you could use a whole range of things as a drug all those sorts of things could be called a drug chocolate could be a drug sugar mm. could be a drug having too much sex. international could well, be a drug telly, binging on telly yeah well just um, i can yeah, stop listen. anytime <laughs> i want Amy. <laughs> So I think it's there's a, there's a degree of sort of behaviour that's within the realm of, quote, air quotes, normal, and then there's a sort of section that's more clinical. Like, for example, if you go for a blood test at the doctor's, you might have, like, climbing cholesterol, but you don't get, like, a, a clinical, it doesn't go into the red zone until death is sort of within scoping distance. So, like, there's a, there's a criteria by which it becomes clinical. Mm. And... 
Oh, crikey, there's so much psych talk in the general zeitgeist in the media at the minute. It's like people are diagnosing themselves left, right and centre and, and they, they're using diagnostic language really loosely mm. to, the point, to the point where I'm not sure it's meaningful. Like it's like everybody thinks they've got autism at the moment. <laughs> yes. Could, could that be what's wrong with me, Imogen? I'm like, well, they, they didn't show up in childhood. It's a developmental disorder. Uh, yes, is your father, uh, you know, really great can, at IT? <laughs> can you? Did you manage to decode nonverbal communication? Yeah, well, you seem to be doing that in this interaction, so that wouldn't. <laughs> anyway, it's it's just I, I don't know what. I think it's, it's everybody's an amateur psychologist, right? Mm. It's not obvious to the, the everyday being who thinks, well, I know what depression is. I feel sad sometimes. Mm. but clinical depression is when you can't get out of bed you can't stop crying you can't stop thinking about killing yourself you just can't like it's a next level of hell that you it's hard to imagine when you're just having a yes. couple, of, couple of days that are no good and then you yes. come good and have a bit of chocolate and get get pull yourself together and that's yes. not depression that's just not feeling yes. good for a few days yes yeah that is a good insight and uh, I think what it takes is a more uh, defined exposure to that experience of a real diagnosis, um, mm. to read a memoir or to read. Uh, I, I am loath to send people to the internet, but you can yes, read so. about what a major depressive episode is like, and I think that helps to realise the difference between that, between a normative human experience yeah. or an understandable emotional reaction to something that is serious and it therefore necessitates as well the best possible treatment we have to offer. Uh, I mean, who would want to have an untreated major depressive episode? Oh, awful. I am not Just putting awful. my hand up for that. No, real clinical depression is horrible. It's just horrifying yeah you wouldn't wish it on anyone no it's not just feeling bad it's like awful just you know just can't get out of the fog just can't do it yes but but I think unless even if I mean and the strange thing is even someone who's had a clinical depressive episode and then come out of it your brain actually changes and it's hard to recall the how horrible it was Yes, yes. If you if you manage to get to the level of recovery or managing it very well and Yes, you know. yeah, which yeah, which is maybe a good thing, hey? Maybe yeah, it's well, like I, childbirth. Well, yeah, yeah, well I think it might be. It's a bit like that. It's like your brain's in a different place. Because it's just like emotion state dependent memory. Like you you access memories in the category of the same feeling. So if your brain's not in that experience, it can't it can't easily access those memories. So yes, yes, yeah. So, I know the brain is oh dear. Anyway, I don't know, but kids aren't like I'm, I'm having a few kids come in to the into the practice that mm. are all, all over YouTube and they're diagnosing themselves with all sorts of crazy things because mm. they they see an expert on YouTube who's talking about it something to a specific population who's usually over the age of thirty five. And the young people decide, well, that's me. I have those thoughts. I'm having intrusive thoughts, they tell me. Mm. They, they, they're coming in and giving me all the clinical language, but it's not being used clinically. It's being used in the colloquial common language use. Yes. They've yes. just hijacked the meaning and decided, oh, I know what an intrusive thought is. Yes. And underlying that, I guess, the kids are suffering. Uh, well, they're, they're suffering. They seem to be suffering from too much exposure to information without it being presented in the context, the context of an actual situation or an actual relationship. It's like somebody on YouTube who's mm. designated it decided they're an expert, on, and they might have some expertise, but that you just don't know who your audience is. And, and then you mm. read the comment comments on YouTube, right? Like some of them are cray cray. They're just like having a lend, you know. They're having a game. And young people can't distinguish between is this serious or is someone taking the piss or like because uh, I, I can't give an example without giving away the case. But it's yeah, something, re- yeah. something really, really, really rare and very concerning in terms of like something like sexual behaviour or mm. you know, 
that's that's salacious in the sense that it's unusual. And young people are very curious, of course, because they're in a stage of development where they're learning things very rapidly. And they decide, well, I have this. I have this perversion. And mm. they don't. They don't. They don't need, like it, haven't. They haven't got as far far enough through sexual development to know what a perversion is. Yes. Yes. So I, I don't know what we're going to do about that. It is a product of the meaning, but it is also a product of their suffering that they. You reckon? Yeah, yeah. That they seek an explanation. That you want to hang it on something. Do you think uh, accessing porn's a result of suffering? Maybe uh, it is. Because it's sort of like that. It's like I'm really curious. I can't look away. It's like I really can't look away from these images, but I'm Mm. not emotionally prepared to understand what I'm looking at. Mm. Mm. And uh, it's I don't think it's the looking at porn that's pathological, but I'm not saying that it's good. I think it's the stickiness. Of the images, of whether or not it is an intrusive image, um, but but yeah, it's really uh, it's tricky. I it's think this intricate. is too much information. Yeah, I think with porn, I think young people are being exposed to sexual images before they've got a chance to understand them in the context of what sex is. Like sex is an attachment behaviour; it's a bonding behaviour. But it's not just looking at an image of, a, of genitals or, like, you know, sexual organs. It's That is disconnected from the, the human relationship that sex has played out in. And you can't explain that to a young person before they've gone through the journey. <laughs> it, well, it's much harder and I think uh, I can feel my anxiety raising oh, okay. even talking Sorry. about this. We, we need some internet controls. Okay. Internet controls are oh. the answer. Internet yeah. controls are hard. actually um, harder to put in place than one might think. Uh, I can I've battled it out with Google and Chrome for hours, yeah. uh, and I did try. It's not harder, but, but yes, it, it was harder than yeah. I expected. Uh, and also, and has it done the job or not? That's a, that's another troubling <laughs> question. And the job of adolescents is to, you know, find cracks in the fences and test boundaries. Like that's their job. So they're going to head for whatever's hidden. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, with a few young people I've had to say, you know, we've opened Pandora's box now. You've landed in the adult world and you're in a place that you don't understand what you're, what you're looking at. So what are we going to do? We can't put it all back in the box. It's out now. All the evil of the world is out and you're stuck in it. Oh, is that... Bloody Tig, he just wants to be involved, doesn't he? Yeah. He's come on in. He's come on Tag, in. He's like the third wheel. What do you wheel. have to offer here? Yeah, what? <laughs> yeah, nothing. He's walking no, no, away. Just mouthing off. <laughs> Extroverts, you know. <laughs> Bless what him. can you do? <laughs> what, what kind of, what's, what's Tiger? Oh, dear. Well, he's just bleating. He's ble- it's, there's a need, isn't there? Isn't it cuddle me? I want food. No one loves me. Maybe um, there's a, He yeah. actually just hang there for one second because he actually just wants the door What's he want? open. Oh, he wants to get out. Um, <laughs> Be right. Just want a hold fire just for a mo. Well. And we're back. Almost. Oops. Just getting the headset on and we're yes. back. So Tiger um, just needs to go and do some cat things, right? Does Can't he, like, go and lie things. around. Yeah. You know? check, the, check out the other cats. What are they up to? Yeah, He's crossing yeah. his boundaries. <laughs> yeah. Can't he just, like, sniff all yeah. of his little nipples? He's got to go and catch up all the over the kitchen, you know. <laughs> so, whinge about Who owners. In an inappropriate place. Yeah. No. He's quite he's quite sort of difficult tiger, isn't he? He's got a difficult <laughs> character. He's sort of can, can crutchety and can, can cantankerous. He's cantankerous as tiger, isn't he? Again, oh, a good dear. insight because tiger's actually pretty old. He's sixty. Is he? Is he? Um, Gosh. Right. Yes, youthful appearance. Did, yeah. Signs of dementia or <laughs> I, I think it could Early be. Onset. Yeah, oh, too many yeah. parallels to me. Like, this is just too disturbing. <laughs> Early adult history of drinking, perhaps, you know, <laughs> d- potential brain damage there. <laughs> anyway, it's on the source. He's been on the source for too long. <laughs> Fantastic. Yet another thing to worry about. 
<laughs> oh dear, sorry. I'm I'm try I'm tickling you, Jerry. I'm derailing you. You've, you've you've got something you're trying to get out. Now, what were we what were we getting into? We we're getting into what? you've got your research. You've got research got today. Research. Yeah, keep my going research. with that. Bang on with that. Um yeah, yeah. My research <laughs> is talking about yes. I've got another super oh, yes. article oh, um, God, from right. the Journal of Consciousness and Cognition, which I I've like never that. dipped into before. No, that's not your <laughs> cup of tea, really. It's just, well, part of it is, half of it is. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. I just want to read about the cognition. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You feel st- like you're on solid ground there. You're like, okay, we can grab something and hold it. Consciousness right. is a bit whip- wispy. Like, what is it? So this right, talks yes. about maladaptive daydreaming, which they yeah. referred to as MD, which, of course, every time I read it, I think major depression. What, uh, what, are they, what does so- MD mean in this context? maladaptive daydreaming. daydreaming how did right. they define it that is a good question yeah, because great question. they should be defining the constructs um okay here we are yeah. difficulty controlling the need or desire to fantasize could that be me um no 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 it's not all about me let's just continue with the definition continue with the definition okay gotta put myself <laughs> together um, no you're right you're right we're doing um, all right Concern that the amount of time spent fantasizing interfered with actual relationships and life goals. Now, oh, okay, what kind yeah. Of person thinks that watching three hundred episodes of that is my life goal. Oh, you're so funny. <laughs> three hundred <laughs> episodes of House Hunters International. <laughs> I, what, I love it. What it's an slightly... achievement! It's in um, the category of binging on Downton Abbey. You know. <laughs> Mm. intense yes yes it's within the realm of normal behavior thank you Emmy. well you know hang on factor three okay factor three right uh, factor element three of maladaptive daydreaming is intense embarrassment regarding the fantasy resulting in exhaustive efforts to keep this behavior hidden okay now, hmm. in this study of 340 people, over 70% reported that they did not experience childhood trauma, hmm. um, thereby providing further evidence that trauma, although potentially a contributing risk factor, is not necessarily causal to MD. That's maladaptive daydreaming, not major depression. That's what they're uh, just subject to the way they define trauma, and it seemed to be a self disclosure definition yes, as opposed to a yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, now, what we've got here is too many bloody terms for things. Oh, bugger it. Um, Psychologists love a term, especially your mob. I, absolutely. And one yeah. of our very best and brightest, who oh, yeah. may he rest in peace, oh, yeah. who died. Last year, Scott Lillianfell, uh, mm-hmm. one of my heroes because yeah. he's the author of uh, Science and Pseudoscience in Clinical Psychology. Oh, wow. Um, he talked about jangle proneness. Isn't that yeah. a beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful expression to coin? Yeah, jangle well, proneness. Is it which sort of is, a- Expression of rumination, sort of, yeah, yeah, okay. No, no, got, he no, says it's yeah. referring, no, no, it's to not. The, referring to the same construct uh, by different names. It's sort of a Fantasy verbiage rumination, yeah. Yeah, ruminate, maladaptive yeah. daydreaming, yeah. positive rumination. It's trying to get control um, over a concept by coming up with lots of names for it. Yes, sort of a, a yes, verbal rumination. comfort eating, yeah. binge eating, eating in the presence of negative affect, oh, eating God. in the presence oh, of that. loss of yeah. control. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, sorry, we trying just to get got super precise, there because yeah. I think there's yeah, we're a back lot on of eating, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. And Todd's um, got some issues with digestion as well. So and he's hovering around in the background. Yeah. Okay, not to distract. Okay, yeah, back on the farm. I, so I read this article and I was a seething mess of emotions with a oh. journal article from <laughs> <laughs> Consciousness and Cognition. Oh. They have examples of people who self-define as maladaptive daydreamers. Oh, great. 
Uh, and this brings up a lot of things because some of them are really sweet and funny. Some of them are, are really sad and uh, sure. and some of them are, well, I'll, I'll let you, I'll let you react. Have a think about it. All right, off we go. Yeah, um, kick, kick okay, off. so one of the, you know, content yeah. areas that they've described, yeah. um, the example is, I'm rich and famous, living oh. in LA and engaged oh. to a supermodel named Sydney. Wow, Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that sounds exciting and, and so delightful. May, maybe Aiden can get together with Yeah, maybe Aiden hook up with, yeah, they can have, have a beer at the very, at very least or maybe Nick the girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I hope, well, it sounds like a great. Yeah, you know, then you can have the whole package. You can have okay. LA. Mm. Okay, here model. we are again. Um, Idealized version of self. Yeah, I mean, okay. cringe, cringe, because I'm sure I'm prone to this. Okay, not about me. <laughs> um, my daydream self is an idealized version of myself. She's queen of a country, a singer, actress, wife, mother, and overall genius. Wow. Oh, my. What's um, so much pressure there? But okay. Yeah. Emmy, they've just described me. No. <laughs> yeah, and no, I was just thinking that. That's Jerry. Look, she's showed up in an article. Gosh, wow. That You've really made it now, Jerry, you know, uh, whatever oh. that means. What yeah. else have we got here? Uh-huh. Um, I have an imaginary brother and five very close imaginary friends. Okay. I add it to real life, imagining that they are in social situations with me. Mm. Um, and, and that's where I feel sad because it, it would yeah. be nice. Nice is not a good word, but you, you, you read some of these things and you, and, and you wish those things for people, you know? Oh, for sure. I um, mean, but I'm, not, I'm not, what's missing in the fantasy land so far, quick observation, we uh, don't have any real intimacy, maybe. Maybe that's what's missing, like real connection. Uh, uh, but but um, it, there's a desire for it or something that looks like it. Anyway, keep going, sorry. Uh, uh, yep. I, uh, yes, yes, there, it, is, it is a lot of wishing. Um so Freud Real used to call this stuff. Scenarios. Here's one. Yeah. All right. Having conversations with a coworker about an event at work. Now, okay. my opinion is that's okay. maladaptive daydreaming because it's just way too boring. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's a very interesting daydream. I'm not quite sure what wish that might be fulfilling. I'm not sure. Uh, support or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Planning my wife's birthday party, envisaging how it will go. Um, oh, man, um, that is. I mean, yeah. surely, is, is that even maladaptive? I, I, well, I think if you was perhaps like everyone do that? <laughs> <laughs> Just to, what, to avoid actually getting organised or... <laughs> <laughs> Um, or just to avoid doing all the all the work because hosting at parties a fair bit of work. It might yeah. be that they, that they're feeling a bit isolated, and maybe wishes for more friends or something like that. Mm, mm. I so what else are we saying? Um, okay, so much to my horror. Mm -hmm. uh, because as you know, I'm convinced I have this, and yeah, mal else you think as it's well. maladaptive, right? Okay. No, no, I don't know if it's maladaptive oh, or not. Okay. I'm in denial. You're not sure. Okay. Yes. Uh, so maladaptive daydreamers endorsed significantly higher rates of attention deficit, obsessive compulsive, and dissociated dissociation symptoms more so than control. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. Um. You think that makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense because it's kind of a coping strategy with something, but it's similar to the use of a drug. It's like we're not moving through. We're not. We're not moving through the experience. It's just holding in a. It's like a holding pattern, and the the daydream mm. itself is is buff, it's creating some kind of temporary respite, while the you, not you personally, but the person is trying to figure out how to cope with whatever it was, whatever the thing was. So you think it is yeah. a form of avoidance, well, a less pathological form of avoidance than, say, drugs. Drug use. So, uh, yeah, I would but a form of point. avoidance nevertheless. It's a protection response. It's the, the, the organism is trying to self-protect. It's, it's mm. trying to make sense of something. 
and it's whatever the something is, it's painful and it's complex. It's not simple. We're just not getting to a solution. Mm. So it's, it's so the fantasy might be an extension of, of imagining what thing like of your brain working, trying to go. Well, how do I solve this? What what do I want? Where do I want to go? What's my goal? Yeah, we're getting that we're getting stuck somewhere in there, and I think that's where trying to imagine in or dream in or get to the bottom of what the fantasy is trying to create helps you kind of move through it and mm. and take take some maybe the person's afraid of taking the risk needed to uh, whatever the fantasy is trying to whatever wish it's trying to fulfil. It's one it's one way of looking at it. You know, as, you- as we talk more and more. It, yeah. It's sounding really similar to rumination. I, I um, think it's a friend or an, a relative of rumination. You know, it's a, a cousin. Yes. Yeah, kind of, maybe a bit distant, depending on the nature of the fantasy, but or a distinct but overlapping construct. Um, I think it performs that, a similar function, but it's but rumination might itself become distressing, whereas a fantasy can be indulgent. It can be like, oh man, you know. Yes. Yes, you're on the money there. Rumination yeah. is a, is in itself exhausting and distressing. Because yeah. it just Moore's keeps going around. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. More's known about rumination because um, we see it so clearly in so many different clinical presentations, but this we don't see as much. So hence you and I are very uh, dependent upon either the embryonic scientific literature, I mean, it's reasonably embryonic, and or our personal experiences because maybe this isn't something clinicians see very often. Maybe people don't come in and say, um, I'm really spending a lot of time in my uh, fantasy world. Uh, hmm. But it well, I'm not sure I see it exactly the same way as you because when you have a presenting case of trauma, varying degrees of disassociation are often present, uh, and developing a fantasy life from a position of to deal with the let's say the frozenness, the frozen distress that can be part of a disassociative state it's a it's a kind of altered state of consciousness and people who have experienced complex trauma go in and out of that as a phenomenon and yes it's like it's like being shattered by something you know something happened and you couldn't cope with it and your sense of self got broken into pieces and that's a very distressing state of being, but it was also a sign that you couldn't cope with whatever whatever event occurred. It was just beyond your conceptualization at the time, beyond your ability to handle, and something broke. Mm. And then mm. once that's happened, you, you you don't have a holistic memory of the breaking process, and that's what treatment sort of has to try and do, put you back together. I, I think that's closer to dissociation, which doesn't yeah. have a kind of. No. Um, well, uh, it's, it, there's degrees of this. Like it's not black and white, you know, it's phenomenological yeah, yeah, rather than. Yeah. So discrete. sometimes we see it, but is it yeah. safe to say we don't see it in a variety of presentations? Uh, mm-hmm. In the sense, yeah. well, we I, see loneliness. Uh, let, let's look at the other trans diagnostic right. processes. Okay. We would mm-hmm. see loneliness in a massive variety of presentations, right? Depression, anxiety, mm-hmm. uh, life events such as retirement, uh, changing jobs. We would see rumination in a variety of presentations and diagnoses. Once again, people losing their job angry rumination, the depressive rumination, uh, I will never get better, and anxious rumination. Uh, So they're the ones I can think of off the top of my head. But fantasy proneness uh, or maladaptive daydreaming, so far we're only seeing it in complex trauma or me. (laughs) Okay. You reckon so the citation should um, read complex trauma and one subject in Australia named Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, well, I think there's a no. couple of reasons you might be finding that in practice. One of them is disclosing a fantasy like that can be risky because yes. it, might be, it might be assumed by the practitioner that you're having a delusion. 
Yes, yes. Which is, it's not quite the same as that. The person who's engaging in a fantasy life is aware that it's an act of play or using their faculties, their imagination faculties. Yes, yes. Um, they And they might be rehearsing a plan or like it's part of the planning capacity for the frontal cortex to go, right, oh, how the hell are we going to solve this problem? Let, could we do it this way or this way or this way? Mm, mm. It's sort of a goal formation planning function or try yes. get, getting a bit stuck, you know, in the actual execution maybe and that's where, you know, we need a bit of work but. Yes, yes. So that is is perhaps the more benign presentation. The other uh, idea is that a delusion is different from a fantasy or a daydream because a fantasy or a daydream can be controlled um, yep. and is also, uh, to a certain extent, what the person chooses Whereas yeah. delusions have a life uh, of their un- own. Yeah, uncontrollable aspect. That's pretty uh, well said. I think that's pretty lucid and clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yes, we are. Delusions are also believed by the person experiencing them. They're like assumed to be real. Yes, yes. And they can insist that others believe them too. Mm. Mm. which brings me to you. You know how I've got the thing of thinking that I've got all of these things um, and possibly there is the evidence (laughs) on the old fantasy proneness. Yeah. (laughs) Very, very benign (laughs) formulation. Uh, uh, But do you think you've got stuff? Wow, Joe. In what sense? Oh, well, what, what's your, what's your favourite diagnosis you like for yourself? For myself? Oh, I don't think about myself in that way, Jerry. I just don't, I don't need a diagnosis to feel whole. Or, <laughs> or more <laughs> troubled. <laughs> I just, I just don't think like that. It's not the way I see myself, you know. Oh, Yeah. I, I, I love, I love to think like that. Uh, <laughs> not- I, don't, I don't, I don't know how to answer the question because see, I think that where, where, the, where you and I differ in practice is I think you like the structure of the process of diagnosis and problem identification and solution, getting a plan together and getting to a, a, a solution. But it, it, even though that's a component of practice, it's not the only thing that, that achieves air quotes and outcome so I think thinking in terms of problems defines it helps a person define them like there's something wrong with me and that in itself can be inhibiting progress in in mm, recovery mm. so I think eventually mm. you want to get to the place where you're like well I, I'm, I'm not the problem there is in fact there isn't a problem anymore I'm, mm. I'm life is just diverse and I can handle issues mm. as they come up but I don't it's, it's like um, it can reinforce a negative self-view, a view of, I mean, view of yourself, it, you know? It, it can. There's a couple of caveats there is that people often come with a problem um, uh, and it may well be um, that they're on, on the money with what the problem is. And I think the interconnectedness Maybe. of all things, like depression is a good example of that. Um, yeah, well, depression Where the clinical... Whole. The, the clinical formulation of what's going on matches what they're experiencing, matches uh, often the problem that they're coming in with, like I can't mm. get out of bed, I keep crying all the time. But I think uh, searching, searching for a problem where there isn't one is pathological itself mm. and it can, be, it can also be malevolent. Yes, yes, true, uh, although sometimes diagnosis or more broadly formulation. I know that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about diagnosis, but formulation is a way of uh, understanding the problem in a more fine-tuned and deeper way. Uh, So I guess I'm saying the same thing as you're saying. Um, If we look at the underlying processes, if we really 
um, tune into the descriptions of what's going on for the person. It actually helps us both in understanding them and and defining what's going on. Yeah. Well, I mean, there has to be sort of agreement on the problem in some form. I suppose that's the ideal purpose of a diagnosis. But some people interpret a diagnosis as a labelling or a diminishing or a derogatory process for them. Like it it inhibits progress rather than facilitates progress. Yeah. It's like a downing, yeah. a putting down, of, uh, like a yeah, especially, vilifying. Or, yeah, especially with the more hardcore diagnoses as we were discussing the personality disorders yeah yeah well, we're a long way people from- i mean so i've got clients that probably meet the criteria for a personality disorder but they react so badly to the label that it inhibits progress. that it's pointless yeah it's pointless so you know? yeah so we talk about but you need a way of labeling what what you're focusing on to improve And I I just think it's a really, it's a case by case, individual by individual negotiation. So some people want a diagnosis. They feel relieved with a diagnosis. Like, okay, I knew there was something wrong. What is the name of it? Now I understand. When that happens, you're collaborating with the person, but you need a level of insight and capacity to facilitate change before that's useful. Otherwise, the person just feels bullied by the words. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's pointless. Why, yeah, why, why do it? Um, so it depends on the situation whether it was going to help or not. Mm, is it mm. going to provide a focal point or a deterrent from progress? Is it going to increase understanding or be yeah. a barrier to understanding? Yeah. Yeah. Is it going to? And it, I, I think not everybody can, like cl- clinical psychology, especially the research you just articulated, is really sophisticated thought. Like being able to handle the jargon, the the jingles that you were saying, like what do they mean and holding those concepts in your mind to to put together and generate a treatment plan, that's beyond the scope of anyone with an IQ lower than 120. Like it's just too too hard Mm. to do. So you have to simplify what what you're talking about. And I've actually wondered about this, whether psychology in some forms as a treatment paradigm is actually not suitable to people with a, with with a, I don't know what level of IQ. And it's really up to the practitioner to adapt their skill set to what the person can do rather than sort of berating them with stuff that goes over their head. (laughs) That that would be cruel. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And there, I mean, it's only as good as what you're doing is only as good as how much it's working for the person. So if it's not working for the person, if the cognitive load is too high, if the explanations aren't resonating with them, then it's not working. Um, so it, I mean, it, one of the, one of the greatest clinicians that we know about is Carl, was it Rogers? Mm. And he, his, his basic technique, and we've all learned it, is active listening. Now, that's not on the surface a very sophisticated intervention, but it is it is going to work with a greater number of people than intricate diagnostic language. Yes. Be- because of its simplicity. Yes. And th- I, then you have to work out why does it work? Like why does that simple mm, technique actually do something? And that mm, is a, a much more complicated conversation, not for the therapy room, that's for outside the therapy room with, co- with colleagues, but that's a widely used counselling technique that is accessible to all levels of skill across professions that don't, not just psychology. And it's a very simple but powerful mm, technique. Mm, mm. I would almost say that it's necessary but not sufficient or, or not sufficient in all cases or all of course it's not but um, it's it's a, got a wide applicability to it like and yes. then you have to ask why why so wide see some clinical language and approaches are not widely applicable mm. Mm. so so who who are they serving and and why you know mm. like who does it work on and why well it, i think everything can be adapted um sure for yeah, example, sure. some high-level concepts, exposure, avoidance, sure. um, exposure response prevention for OCD, 
are in fact, and they sound really technical and they are, um, but they're sure as hell not so technical when you're doing it with a kid. Uh, So so they can be uh, adapted up and down the developmental level. Sure, Uh, and that's the skill of the practitioner to get that mm, right. mm. Otherwise it doesn't. Doesn't mm. work. Yeah, yeah. It, it, otherwise, it's it's pointless. Yeah. What are you doing? Um, psycho- the practice of psychology is part science, but it's also part art. Mm. Like the mm. and and in a way, your whole skill set and everything you bring to the process is a bit like being an artist or a musician as well as a scientist. Yes. Yes, and also, therefore, it involves practice. It, like, I, lots I think of lots of practice. Yeah, I, th- I think that's actually a good analogy um, because not only do you need the formal training, you need practice. You need lessons for your oboe. I mean, a really good oboe, uh, oboist, a really good oboe player. <laughs> um, oboist note may or may not really be a word. I uh, would give lessons and receive lessons. Well, uh, I think one of, one of the hardest things to get progress going is getting to a place of acceptance of what's happened. Like that, that could be the bulk of treatment. Like what what is what is wrong with me? What is the problem? what has happened to me Mm. and I suppose like my primary approach in practice is very client-centered very person-centered not problem focused Mm. not problem centered and if you start from that position it it has a lot of scope for growth and it allows the the client person that you're working with a lot of capacity to grow in autonomy and independence and self-directedness Mm, and we know absolutely. that those prin- we know that those principles are, are really essential for long term recovery and long term, you know, moving past the problem. So from that perspective, I'm I'm not gun ho around defining a problem as the first protocol. I'm preferring to define the problem with the client's collaboration. Yes. So that they that helps yeah. them take ownership of what's going on. Whereas if you impose a diagnosis on somebody, they can just feel attacked by it. I I I think so. I think it is one of those big situations where it depends because some yeah. people come in um, with layered and uh, nebulous problems, yeah. and some people um, do just come in with "I just don't want to have panic attacks anymore." Well, that's um, that's a, in some ways a simple thing because the person's already defined the problem. Mm, They've got to a place of acceptance. Mm. But when they come in with a nebulous presentation, you've got to first work out in your mind what what they're trying to articulate to you. Yes, yes, which might not always be so yeah. clear. No. Um, uh, one thing I think we're all agreed on is 10 sessions isn't enough. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, for lots of things it's not. You can be you can be really efficient and I'm super super as efficient as I can be, but uh yeah, 10 sessions is still really well, 10 sessions if if your client is able to afford them all and they can come for mm. 10 sessions. I mean, I think you're more likely to get six and I think the data that um CSIRO has <laughs> is that the name of the stats compiling I can't remember. The stats compiling department in Canberra, mm. you know, report consistently reports people get to six sessions, hence why the first six are funded, like on the first referral. Then you have to go for a review. Mm. But that allows you to do a bit of psychoeducation, get some um, rudimentary behavioural strategies in place mm. and maybe some cognitive strategies and a little bit of homework. And then that's all you can do. Mm. Mm. It is, it is, you've got to be hyper efficient because what's not included uh, yeah. in the conceptualization of Medicare is first couple of sessions, usually assessment and, I know. and or feedback. You have to do it all one, at once. Yeah, yeah, that's that process that you're talking about, about articulating the problem, or, you know, what are we here for? Um, and that that can be quite pressurised, can't it? I think depending uh, on where you're practising and what kind of client group you're working with, your clients might be more or less able to articulate. They might come in and say, I just feel bad. I feel mm, bad. I don't know why. Mm, That's mm, tricky. What does that yes, mean? Yes, yes. Uh, so take-home yeah. messages. Yeah, take-home <laughs> messages. Take home. Well, so I'm not um, – so Jerry's got some daydreaming. We're not sure if it's a problem. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. 
could be healthy probably is stress reduction. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it probably is. Are you listening, that, Stephen it, it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to inhibit any um, major independent maintenance activities <laughs> like yeah. feeding self or um, yeah, getting to work. feeding cats. Um, mm. So I think I do like it as, as a trans-diagnostic process. It will be something maybe oh. I'll start to ask people about. I have to think about that. Well, um, I think the, the more Maybe not in the they, first 15 minutes. Well, the more comfortable they feel with you, so if you try the old person-centred approach, they're more, much more willing to share their inner world with you and, and share mm. things like that because people, mm. people I work with are fairly willing to share daydreams and that sort of thing. Because yes. it's part of building that therapeutic alliance, you know. Yes. And you have to um, come at it with an attitude of acceptance and, like, um, compassion. Otherwise that doesn't happen. People will be guarded otherwise. Yes, yes. Uh, or perhaps <laughs> I won't expect. <laughs> There's a lot of normalising that can be done. <laughs> well, we all do this sometimes. <laughs> Oh yes, is a good base point, <laughs> and and depending on whether there's a double signal there, you you might go further or or not. It depends. Yeah, whether there's whether there's congruence in the way you communicate, because that that'll can that'll indicate whether you can be trusted or not with something risky like sharing a daydream. Will I be perceived as being psychotic? <laughs> yes, like, you know, like how strong yeah. is that critic? Do I feel them looking at me? Can I trust that I will be cared for? Is this a yes. safe disclosure? Yes. All that stuff. Yes, which is why a daydream anyway. may not come out in session one. Maybe it doesn't need <laughs> Maybe to. Maybe not. Well, um, all, all right. Well, I'm just looking at that time, Jerry. We're just up against it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. until the and next. And we've got lots of daydreaming to to be doing. Yeah, <laughs> lots of daydreaming. So. Lots of daydreaming. All righty. I'll. We'll say goodbye for the minute. We'll say, Until we'll say goodbye. Time. See you Bye. soon. May all Bye. your daydreams be wonderful. Bye. Bye. Bye.